Hi, welcome to our Hot Rod Bible Study tonight. So, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 tonight. It's an exciting chapter. Uh, You know, Ephesians has been such an exciting book. I I want to, you know, thank Willie uh, for giving me the opportunity to to be in Ephesians. A couple of things about Ephesians that I wanted to share with you. You know, Ephesians is six chapters. Um, A couple of things that I'd like to share. You know, chapters 1 through 3 kind of speaks of the spiritual privileges we have in the Lord. Um, as, as we walk with the Lord, the adoption, acceptance, our redemption in the Lord, our forgiveness, wisdom. And also we remember that the sealing of the Holy Spirit when we um, accept God's gift, as we studied Ephesians 2, 8, um, with which the key verse that we are saved by grace, and it is not of ourselves, but it is a gift. It is a gift of God. And so um, this is chapters 1 through 3. And so last week, as Willie was in chapter 4, 4 through 6 is now how we're to walk now as new believers uh, in Christ. Um, And he's talking to the Ephesians um, how they should walk uh, in the Lord um, and and walk as a new man, a new woman, uh, a new child of God and how we're to walk. And so we'll see that. And he'll actually talk to us a little bit about... um, marriage, how we're to walk in marriage, how we're to walk with our children. And interesting, as Willie gets into chapter 6, it'll actually be um, also is how we're to walk as employees and employers. It's, it's going to be it's going to be amazing uh, next week. But uh, we're going to go through chapter 5. But before we get started tonight, let's pray for tonight's study. So, Father God, we're, uh, we're thankful, Father, for your goodness and your love for, for us each and every day, Father. Lord, we, uh, we pray, Father God, for all the people in the mountain communities that are uh, being affected by this fire um, that has been going on. Um, Lord, we ask, Lord, that you would be with them. Lord, we ask that you would be with the firefighters who are up there. Give them peace, Father. Protect them. Um, Lord, we have uh, dear friends up there. Um, Art and Yolanda, Lord, we ask that you would be with them. Um, we heard word from them today, Lord, that they have not been evacuated, and so we're thankful for that, Lord. Um, but we pray, Lord, that you would uh, open up our hearts tonight to hear from you tonight. That is our desire. And so we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So chapter 5, um, you know, as, as Willie was asking me about chapter 5, he said, uh, you know, you, we're going to be in chapter 5 of Ephesians. Uh, you know, I said, you know what, the only thing I know about Ephesians is I, I know verse 22 that says wives submit to their husband. And, and it's always that every time that I, I get into Ephesians, most of the time when I hear somebody preach about Ephesians 5, most of the time it is about this submission. Um, well, we're going to get into that tonight, but... We're thankful that God's word is so true that we go um, verse by verse. And so we're going to jump in here in um, verse 1 of chapter 5. It says, Therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. You know, I believe it was uh, Pastor Chuck Smith that said, when you see the word therefore, um, that we should stop and ask ourselves, what is it there for? Um, And it's interesting that, as we know that the Bible, as it was originally written, it didn't have chapters and verses in it. That uh, men kind of use that so we could tell um, the different reference points that we needed to be in the God's Word. That when we were studying God's Word, we would have a reference point. And so the chapter breaks are not always. And this is kind of a here a continuation of chapter four, um, verse thirty-two. And so I'm going to read verse uh, four thirty-two, and it goes really well with this. And so in verse thirty-two of chapter four, it says. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And then it says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. So we see that God is calling us to imitate him. And, and he gives us some examples here. He says to be kind and to be tender-hearted. And, and this is the, I, I didn't have a problem with the kindness and being kind to others. I didn't have a problem with that. Tender-hearted. We're going to see something about tenderheartedness here, but forgiving one another. And this is oftentimes where I struggle. Uh, oftentimes when people do things to me, I, I seem to have unforgiveness in my heart. And, you know, as studying God's word, he's actually opened up my, my heart to be more forgiving. Um, and, and the reason why is because as we read in Ephesians 2, that it is a gift of grace that God has given us. I didn't do anything to deserve that grace. 
He gives it to me because He loves us and we are His children and so He loves us. And so I need to know that oftentimes when I harbor like unforgiveness, I harbor it in my heart, that I need to know that Satan brings along his friend and his friend is bitterness. And when bitterness enters my heart, then my heart becomes hard and, and it gets away from what God has called us here to be tender hearted. And so we need to be tender hearted, forgiving one another. And, and we're going to see a little bit more about this as we talk of the marriage relationship as we get into that in verse 22. But we're called to imitate God as, as being loving. But as he said here in the end of the verse there, he says, as dear children. And it reminded me that oftentimes that if you're blessed enough to have children, oftentimes um, there are certain traits that our children pick up from us. And sometimes they're not always good traits. Uh, but as our, our wives sometimes will remind us and say, yes, he's definitely your son. Look at the way he's acting. And so these are kind of the things that it reminded me of this. And also, um, but there will come, a, come along times that you'll be a pastor or maybe a teacher from school will come along and say, you know what, your son is doing really good and he's a very respectful young man. And I admire that. And so we, we enjoy if when people actually talk to us about our children and God is no different. He is delighted when he sees himself in us. And this is what we are called to do, to, to actually to love others and to, to be loving and kind to one another. And he's going to continue this here in verse 2. And in verse 2 it says, And walk in love as Christ also has loved us and had given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. So we see that God has called us to walk in love. And, and what's interesting about God's walk with us, we see that it is a sacrificial love. God says in, in John 3.16, we're very familiar with it, that God so loved the world, right? That God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whoever believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. And we know this verse, but what's interesting, what makes this verse so powerful is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for the people that were giving their hearts to him that, that he had already, he had died for even while we were still sinners. And that's, that's from Romans 5, 8. And so it's just so amazing to see. And so this sacrificial love that God has shared with each and every one of us, we're going to see it in chapter 22 or verse 22 of the chapter here. And it's how we're to carry ourselves in the marriage relationship. It is so powerful that we see that sacrificial love as we walk in love. Uh, at the very end of the verse there, it talked about God having a sweet smelling aroma. In, in the Old Testament, they used to offer sacrifices to God. And as they offered those sacrifices, as they were having the meat, and they were actually having the, the actual meat uh, there in the fire, that aroma would come up. And as that aroma would come up, it would be a, a pleasing smell to the Lord. And so when we love others, it is a sweet smelling aroma to God that He is pleased when He sees us loving others. And remember what the Bible says. It's, the Bible says that we are supposed to be known by the love that we have for one another. That's how we're supposed to be known. But here in verse 3 it says, But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetedness, let it not even be named among you as it is fitting for saints. So we see fornication here, that, that we see that Paul now is addressing the sexual sin that was going on in Ephesus. You see, the Ephesians were used to having a goddess Diana, right? The... Um, the, God, the great goddess Diana, right? That she was the one that was there in Ephesus and people were coming and she was like a fertility God. And so you can imagine the things that were going on in Ephesus. And so Paul is calling the people that they no longer have to live in this sexual sin that is going on. What's interesting is in this word uh, fornication here is we get the word pornea, which we get the English word uh, pornography. And so this is what God, he's talking about here, uncleanliness. He's talking about impurity or uh, immoral. Uh, covetedness, we're familiar with Ephesians 20 that talks about the Ten Commandments. In commandment number 10, thou shalt not covet. It even actually says, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife. And so these are sins that are sexual in nature. And so Paul is calling the people that they no longer as believers need to walk in this way. And what's so interesting about this is that Paul is talking to people who are believers in Christ. He is not talking to unbelievers. He is talking to believers. 
And so if he is talking to believers, he is talking to us. It's so important that we understand that God, through, through Paul, is, God is speaking to us. And so in verse 4 it says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. So Paul gets into the area of speaking about their language, uh, foolish talking, coarse gesturing. This is like dirty jokes, telling, cussing, saying things that are improper. And, and Paul is pointing out that we no longer have to do that either. It's so important that we don't do that. And what's important about that is that Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so oftentimes when we slip and we let some things come out of our mouth, it's not the end of the world. And, and what's interesting to me is there's often times that people that I work with or people that I know that oftentimes if they cuss or they say a cuss word, they'll come up to me and they'll say, oh, I'm sorry, Mike, for what I said. And, and I say, it's no problem. It's not like I haven't heard it before or even said it myself at one time in my life. But what's interesting to me, I love when they come to me and tell me that it's because it lets me know that I need to share more of Christ and imitate more of Christ in their presence. I need to imitate more of Christ. And it really speaks to my heart. Um, But also, too, it says that when people are actually talking about, you know, maybe dirty jokes or they're cussing, oftentimes it works that we can give thanks. We can go in maybe in, in, in the area of where they're at and say, hey, you know what the Lord has done in my life? I'm so thankful for what God has done in my life. And so as God's word will cut the, uh, the, this kind of talk out. And this is what Paul is addressing the Ephesians to here. So in verse 5, it says, For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And so we see that oftentimes I've heard this particular verse being preached, and it oftentimes says, do you see, does everybody see what these things are? And it says, if you are those, then you are not going to have any inheritance in the kingdom of God, in which we all know this. But we need to know tonight, and the reason why I wanted to bring this up tonight is we need to know that if we will surrender or we will give, ask God for forgiveness, even if we've committed any of these sins, that God forgives us and he remembers them no more, right? Hebrews 8.12, he remembers our sins no more. It's so important for us to remember that he remembers our sins no more. So we no longer, if one time or another, we were any of these things, that we still have an inheritance in the kingdom of God because He remembers what we've done in the past if we have asked for forgiveness. And so the grace of God once again comes and rescues us. It's just God is just so loving. So in verse 6 it says, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. The sons of disobedience are people who are not walking in the will of God, what, what it says here, it says, let no one deceive you with empty words. You know, when I was young growing up, uh, oftentimes I, I worked in a, in a factory and, and oftentimes I would hear people come along and when somebody would maybe talk about God's word, and this was before I was a believer, oftentimes people would come along and say, you don't need to listen to them, you need to listen to us and remember everybody is doing it, so it's okay. And this is what they're talking about here, about empty words. You see, the world always wants us to believe that it has everything we need. You know, it's interesting, I I mentioned some signs, uh, FedEx, last time I was here. And actually, uh, something else I want to share with you, the sign Amazon. I know we're all familiar with Amazon, and we're all familiar how it has a little arrow pointing from the bottom. And what it's actually pointing to is from the A to the Z, meaning that they have from A to Z. And that's what the world wants us to think, that it has everything we need. But we need to remember that in Revelation um, 12, 32, that it says that I am, Jesus speaking says, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. And so Jesus is all we need. This, this world will not leave us satisfied. It will not fill our souls, right? We need to know that we need to know that we need those things from God. And so it's just so important that we would remember those things. And in verse 7 it says, Therefore, do not be partakers with them, 
You see, they're calling us not to walk in the ways. And Paul is talking to the Ephesians for them no longer to walk in those ways. And we, we know that we don't need to walk in the ways of the world. But I don't believe that this is a verse that would exclude us from the world. There is often times that preachers have used this particular verse to say, see, we need to segregate ourselves away from people and we only need to share the gospel with people that are believers. And this is not true. God has called us to take the gospel to the world, each and every one of us to take the gospel to the world. Another interesting thing about this um, partakers with them is interestingly enough that there was people who have come to Christ later on in life and this really spoke to me. They asked them, what, what, what hindered you from coming sooner to come to know Christ? Was it God himself? Did, were you, was it the conviction of the Holy Spirit? And, and oftentimes there has been many, they took a survey and there's been many people who had said that they were led away by Christ by the witness they saw through other people who were believers. That really spoke to me. And so we are to know, as God spoke to us here, that we are to be imitators of Christ, loving others, not being judgmental, to, to love others and to let them know that there is a Savior that came to save us all from our sins. This is so important. And so in verse 8 it says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. I love the way that it, as I was studying this, I noticed that it didn't say that you once walked in darkness. It actually says that you were once darkness. And that's me, right? I once walked without you, Lord. And so I was not only walking in darkness, I was in darkness. But now the light of the Lord, so we are to walk as children of the light. We are to walk as children of the light. It's so important for us. And remember that our Savior, Jesus Christ, in John 8.12 said, I am the light of the world. And we are, as children, are to walk in that light. The light of, of the world, we are to walk in it. And in verse 9 it says, For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. As we were going through Galatians, we, we saw uh, the fruit of the Spirit in all the different areas. But when I was looking at this today, I, it just really spoke to me that, you know, as we read the fruit of the Spirit... We all know that the first fruit of the Spirit is love, but really the reality is that each one of the, the words that come after that are actually a byproduct of what love is. And it's joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That comes from uh, Galatians 5.22 and 23, if you're taking notes. So we see that the fruit of the Spirit are those things, and this is who we are to reflect Christ, the light and the love of Christ. And so in verse 10 it says, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. We are to seek the Lord and find out what is acceptable, and there is no other way, there is no other shortcut, finding out what it is, the, the acceptable uh, will of the Lord is, is no other way by spending time in God's Word. Daily we should be spending time in God's Word. And in verse 11 it says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. When I saw this verse for the first time, I, I, I often I, I thought about it and I, I laughed a little because I, when it said expose them, I said, well, does that mean that I go to the sin police and I kind of report them that, hey, these people are out of line over here, that I need to expose them. But what I love about it is that Pastor Chuck Smith said what we need to do to expose them is that we need to expose them to the light. And oftentimes that light is us as believers. We are not to shun ourselves from people who don't know Christ, but we are to go and give them light. I shared this the other night that this actually does work. And I, I put it, as I was studying this, I actually put it to work. See, my son, he plays baseball. And I really wish that... Um, adult coaches would find another way to express themselves rather than cussing at, at young men um, as, as they play baseball. But oftentimes I would go there to pick him up and I would hear this language. But a couple of weeks ago I, I shared that I actually took my Bible with me and I sat in the front row where I knew they would be speaking to the boys. And you would be, interested, you would be surprised how the language really toned down just by bringing the light to the field where we were at. And we were out at a park. And so it was just so 
I just love the way that God's word, there is power in the word of God. And so we, the people see that and they, they will see the light of Christ and we can shine light. So important for us to do that. And in verse 12, it says, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret. And so we are not to call to speak about gossip or to speak about things that are done in sin or be going behind people's back. And in verse 13, it says, but let all things that are exposed are made manifested by the light for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. You see that it is Christ once again giving us the light. That we see that it is Christ that it gives us the light. And you see that this verse is actually saying whenever it is, the, anything is exposed to the light, it becomes influenced by the light. And so we as children of the light are called to go out into the world and to expose people to the light. This is what we're called to do as believers. We're called to expose people to the light because they will be influenced by it. Believe it or not, God's word never goes out void. It always goes out and people will come to know Christ. So here in verse 15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And this word circumspectly means that we would walk carefully in our new relationship as we are believers now, as, as he's talking to the Ephesians here, they walk carefully, making wise decisions, godly decisions. And it isn't that we're supposed to make decisions about the people that we interact with, but we can't tell people that we're going to go to the bar and try to save people and have them come to know Christ. More than likely, we're going to be read, led down that path. And so we need to share Christ with people and, and there's nothing wrong um, with going and sharing with other people that don't know Christ, but we need to do it and not be influenced by them. Remember, we have to influence them by the light, right? We, we can't be influenced by the world. And it's verse 16, it says, Redeeming the time because the days are evil. This is a, a very powerful verse here because redeeming the time, we are in the midst of a pandemic that is going on, and, and the world is actually... Uh, doesn't know what to do at this particular time, but Jesus was never surprised by this pandemic. He knew exactly what was going on. And so we need to be doing the work of Christ. We need to be sharing with our friends. We have family members. I know I have a lot of family members, a lot of friends who don't know Christ. And, and this reading this verse here in this chapter, it really spoke to my heart that I need to be doing more to reach others who don't know you. And nobody knows the, the end of times. Oftentimes, it seems like as this pandemic, a lot of people have been thinking about uh, the end of days. Um, but we need to know that nobody knows the day or the hour, right? Not even the angels in heaven. But I wanted to read something to you from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Um, and it talks about the end of days. Um, and this is what will be prevalent. And it says here, and I'll just it's four verses. It's in three uh, verses 1 through 4. And it says, but know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, Lover, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. And so we can see in those, in that particular verse there, we can see that those verses that we don't know when the day or the hour when Jesus is coming, but we oftentimes we know that it is closer today than it was yesterday. And so we need to be doing the work of what God has called us to. And, and we learned as we were studying with Willie in chapter 4, we learned that we've all been given a gift and we need to, if we don't know what our gift is, we need to be asking the Lord, what is our gift? Lord, pray, ask the Lord, what is our gift that we may go out and, and, and share the love of Christ with the world? This is what we need to be doing. It's so important for us to be doing those things. And so in verse 17, it says, Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see, the will of the Lord is the best plan there is for our lives. Oftentimes, 
when I was younger and when I didn't know Christ, I oftentimes said, no, no, I know what's best for me and for my family. But the reality is that there is no plan better than the plan that Christ has for my family and for myself. God has the best plan for each and every one of us, and we need to seek the will of God as we spend time in God's Word. So important for each and every one of us to do that. And in verse 18 it says, And do not be drunk with wine, which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit. Dispensation, it means it's a waste. You see, the Ephesians, they felt that if when they drank alcohol, that they would, with their pagan gods, that they would get into a communication with their pagan gods. And what Paul is calling them to here is he's saying, you don't have to drink wine or be drunk with wine to have that communication with them, but you need to be filled with a spirit. And, and oftentimes, this is a, when, when this verse talks about being filled with a spirit, it isn't a one-time event. It is that we are to come and spend time in the Word of God and be filled with the Spirit on a daily basis or on a regular basis, if not daily, on a regular basis. We need to be filled with the Spirit. It is so important for us to, to know this. Um, oftentimes people talk, other commentators have talked about being filled with the Spirit. They often attribute it to maybe like a glass of water being filled to the brim of water. Um, others have said like a sail that's being filled with air and pushing them along. But I love the, uh, one of the commentators said that it's like a latex glove with all the stuff that's going on with COVID. We've been seeing that a latex glove can actually do nothing by itself. It just sits there. But as soon as you put your hand in it, which is the Holy Spirit, it is able to do the work of God. And we can see that that's what we're called to be filled with the Spirit on a constant basis. What I also loved about this parallel verse here that Paul used being drunk with wine and being filled with the Spirit, he used it. Oftentimes when people are drunk, they say that they are under the influence, right? And so we, Paul is calling us to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit, right? Of God's Word, we are called to be under the influence of Christ. This is what he's calling us to. And we all remember that in Acts 2, when the Holy Spirit was being poured out, they actually accused them of being drunk. Right? We remember that. Because being filled with the Spirit, it gives us that, it isn't, a, it isn't an internal feeling, it gives us a feeling of peace, of knowing that we are in the will of God. So important for us to know that. So in verse 19 it says, Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So this is a sign of being filled with the Spirit that we actually have a song or a hymn in our hearts and we might go along humming them. Oftentimes, I shared this the other night, that oftentimes when we're at church, if you're standing too close, from, close to me, the reality is that I can't sing. But God has called me to give a joyful noise. And if, if you come by me, oftentimes when the singer, he stops singing, I, I, stop, I stop and not sing so loudly because I know that I really truthfully can't sing, but I have a song in my heart. And that's what we're called to have a song in our heart. And in verse 20, it says, giving thanks always, um, all, giving, th giving thanks always for all things to God, the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Also another sign of being filled with the Spirit, that we come to understand that Christ has brought us to a place that is just amazing, that He has given us grace and He has given us love and mercy when we didn't deserve any of it. And we are to be thankful of the blessings that God has poured upon us, the blessings of our children, our wives, uh, and the things that He's blessed us with in our lives, even the workplace, even the place that we work with, and even actually the people that we're surrounded with, the people that we get to come to know. We are so be thankful for all that God has done in our lives. It's so important. And we are to know and, and love others. And so in verse 21 it says, Submitting to one another in the fear of God. And so we're going to get into submitting to one another. Um, this is called submitting as Christians one to the other, as we love other people and even people who aren't believers. We are called to submit. If they are in the workplace and you have a, a supervisor who is not a believer, it doesn't mean that we're not to believe, you know, we're not to follow him. We are to follow him in the workplace. 
Um, after the workplace, after work is over, you don't, you don't necessarily have to follow him to wherever he's going, but we need to respect people that we work for and, and, and be respectful and submitting to one another. So in verse 22, it says, this is the verse that everybody has been waiting for us to get to. And it says, wives, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. And as it talks about as to the Lord, we as men, oftentimes I've seen men use this particular verse, say, okay, wife, you see that God has called me, called you to submit to me. So now I'm the boss and you have to do whatever I say. That's not what God's word says. Um, it does, it's not a period right after it says wives submit to your husband is not a period it is a comma and so we see as to the Lord we need to be walking in the Lord and as they submit to the Lord they should submit to us as husbands the work in the word um, submit I wanted to bring that up I think it's important in the Greek um, the work the word is called hupotazo and I think it'll have some understanding as we see this the word hupo it means to be under or beneath. And the word tazo means to be arranged in an orderly manner. And when, uh, when I was studying this, I, I, often, I came across something that really made sense to me. It said that you don't want to put the cart before the horse, right? It's out of order. And this is what God is saying here in the household. And the same thing as us men, as we're, as we're uh, car guys, we oftentimes... We wouldn't want to put a trailer. You wouldn't put a trailer in front of your truck, right? Your trailer wouldn't pull your truck. And this is the same thing that God is calling us. You see, we have different roles in the marriage relationship, but God has called men um, to, be, to lead their families. And we're going to get into that, but he's also called wives to submit. And I think oftentimes wives, they think that this means that God says that they are lesser but know in the marriage relationship that there is an equality. And we're going to get to that as he says that we become one as we marry. And we're going to see that. In verse 23 it says, For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. We see that Christ, as he is the head of the church, um, we see that husbands are the God-appointed leaders of the home. And this is what God has called us as men, and he is going to hold us accountable to that. I, you know, I oftentimes I think that I know people in the workplace that their children, as I've sometimes I've, they've been around the workplace when I'm there, and they ask, ask their father, hey, dad, are we going to go to church uh, this, this Sunday? And I believe that our children should never have to ask us if they're going to go to church. They should, it should be a given that this is what we do Sunday. We need to give time to God. It's so important. And so as us being leaders in the household, we have a tremendous responsibility to raise our family and to know Christ. And this goes as far as I, I know other men um, that oftentimes that they often like to share the word of God with their wives. They sit around and it's nice coming to a Bible study and sharing um, God's word with each other, men's Bible study. But it's also nice to sit alone with your wife at times and, and share the word of God and just read a passage and ask your wife what she saw in it. And you will you know, express to her what you saw in it. It'll make your relationship so much better. Um, but God has called us to... Uh, to do those things, to be the leaders of our family. So in verse 24, it says, Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So wives are called to submit to their husbands, but we see that God made men and gave them a need to lead. And there's a reason for this, that women think that, you know what, you, you know, the women, some, there's some women out there that oftentimes think, well, you don't know my husband. He, 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 he can't lead the family. I, I need to lead. But we need to understand that God appointed, this is the way that God appointed the marriage relationship to be. And God knows more. And he, and he actually made men and he knows what we need. And we're going to see, we're going to get into the women. But I believe that one of the things that men, they will stay back if they are allowed, if God would not call them to lead in the household, that they will stay back and they will allow the wife. And this is the reason I believe that God has called us as men to be the leaders of our house. Um, but really, reality is that God has only called women to do one thing. He has actually called them to submit to their husband as they submit to the Lord. And he has called, you're going to see that we're going to get the rest of the verses, that he has called us as husbands. He gave us also one 
um, command to do here or one, one thing to do with our wife to love our wives. And we're going to see that. But women know that in this particular verse that if you don't submit to your husband, you're not actually in disobedience to your husband. You're actually being in disobedience to the Lord. So, you know, it, it's, 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 it's interesting that, that those are the things that the Lord has called us to. But I also like to point out that as the Lord was addressing the wives, only three verses for the wives, nine verses for the husband. And so I think the Lord knows that us as men, as husbands, we need to hear it a little more than the women can kind of get it the first go around. But us men, you have to tell us a couple times before we can really get into it. So in verse 25, it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. You see that Adam, he gave, or he, he actually, a rib was taken from him for his bride. And we see that Jesus was pierced and he died for his bride, the church. And so we see that it is a sacrificial love that Christ died. He died, and this is what Christ has called us, to die to our desires and to love our wives. This is what God has called us to do as men. You know, in the family relationship, I, I know times are changing, but us as men, as husbands, we also need to stand up and break the chain of the things that have gone on in the past. I grew up in a household where my father oftentimes were out doing his own thing and he was out living his life. But he, the thing about it that I, I love the fact that, you know, one of the reasons that I don't drink alcohol is because I think my father drank enough alcohol for the rest of our family. And, and this is one of the reasons why I don't drink alcohol. And so us as husbands, we need to know that our children are in the home. And the greatest example that we can have as our children is the way that we live our lives out in front of our children. So important. But one of the greatest um, the greatest honors that I've ever received actually came as for a husband and as, as a husband and as a father that I ever received is from one of my daughters that she actually said that dad I would want a husband just like you and, and it really it almost brought tears to my eyes but as she thought about it for a minute she said but hopefully he's a lot taller and a lot more hair yeah. so I oftentimes, it almost brought tears to my heart, but I know that this is a, a thing that we're called as husbands and as fathers. We're, we're called to, to, uh, to love our children and love our wives. And through loving our wives, our children will see and we will become the example for their families. We need to do those things, men. And so in verse 26, it says, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that she should be holy and without blemish you see what Christ is doing here is he's trying to clean the church this is the reason why God has called us not to be fornicators not to be the things that he talked about in verse 3 and just like in the book of Esther we remember that in the book of Esther if you're familiar with it there was beauty preparations that were going on for Esther and this was a period of time that she was soaking for a long time in oil and perfume and she was getting cleaned up and this is what the Lord is doing he is cleaning up the church to return and take his church to heaven with him and this is what Christ is doing but remember that Christ is long-suffering he is waiting I know oftentimes I, I know believers that have been walking with Christ for 30 40 years and they've oftentimes said, I don't think he's coming back, but God's word is true. He will return. He will come back for his church. And we need to know that that day, we don't know when the day or the hour is, but we need to know that his word is true. So in verse 28, it says, So husbands ought to love uh, their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And see, as we're called to love our wives as we love our own bodies, I think the Lord knew all along that us as men, that we do love ourselves. You know, uh, they took a survey at a gym, and they, they often said that they put up mirrors in the gym, and people would say, oh, so people could see themselves working out. Uh, but the reality is, the survey actually says that actually so men could see themselves working out in the gym. They say that women very rarely look into the mirrors as they're working out. It is the men that oftentimes are looking at themselves. Uh, 
And I just thought it was interesting that we see that men are constantly looking at themselves. And I think the Lord knew that we love ourselves. And so he is calling us as much as we love ourselves, we need to love our wives. This is what we need to do. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished, cherished it, and it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his, holy, of his body, of his flesh, and his bones. You see, we are members now of the church, and so we are members of Christ. And so we, God is calling us to reflect Christ, that we would walk and we would imitate God. And this is what God is calling us to. And so we see verse 31 here. It says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You know, oftentimes this is shared at weddings, um, in wedding uh, vows, they often say, and, and as we talk about the marriage relationship, we remember the vows that we said to one another as when we got married to love, honor, and cherish another person uh, for all the days of my life. Remember that? And to see, this is the thing that the world is getting away from is that, you know, the world thinks that love is one of those things and as we talk about this sacrificial love that Christ loved us he loved us while we were yet sinners and you see in the marriage relationship as husband and wife oftentimes there's people who come and I've heard people come that they have fallen out of love with their husband or their wife and you see God has called us to obey him and even though that we have a feeling of love right a feeling of love it is a a respect a, a reverence to God that we are to love our wives and our spouse, and that, that love can come back again. And oftentimes that love isn't a feeling. It is something that God has instilled in us in a marriage. It is a covenant that he has made, and that we are to love our wives and treat our wives as Christ loves the church. And so it's so important as we said those marriage vows, oftentimes we need to go back and remember what we said to this person, until death do us part until death do us part. It wasn't until I get tired of you. It wasn't until I get tired of, of, of loving you. It's until, until a sickness comes along. No, it's until death do us part. So important that we made that commitment with God. And we need to remember that. So in verse 32, it says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. This great mystery that the Lord is, is pointing out here is I believe that the Lord has instituted marriage so that we would understand the relationship that he wants to have with each and every one of us. You see, we love our wives, and as we're called to love our wives, Christ loves us. And this is the reason why Christ doesn't want us going out into the world meddling in things that, that will hurt us. And, and oftentimes when, when people hear this, this chapter 5, and the Lord is talking about these things, He's not telling us that we need, these are not a set of rules and regulations that we need to um, adhere to. We remember what he said in verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 8. He said, we are saved by grace. We are already saved. And so we don't need to do these things to be saved. But as, as we are saved before Christ, we need to know that these things, we need to stay away from them to be a representative of Christ, to represent him of all the things that he's done in our lives. And in verse 33, it says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The only thing that, she, that the Lord called her here to, he called her to respect her husband. One of the things that, that uh, as, as I find a, a point of respect for your husband, oftentimes I, I hear women uh, come to the workplace, and, and they oftentimes, they, I've heard people say, you won't believe what happened at, at, work, at, at home yesterday. You won't believe how stupid my husband is. And we should never be disrespectful to our husbands in that way. We should always try to elevate our husbands and try to give them uh, the respect that they deserve as, as husbands. I got a small story to, to close with tonight. My 14-year-old uh, my daughter... Uh, was going through uh, some old videos at home and she stumbled across a movie that she has never seen before and the name of the movie was called Schindler's List and I, and I know many of us are familiar with the movie um, but it is a movie about a man who was in Nazi Germany and he owned a factory and what I love about the movie is that he actually took people 
and he allowed them to come and work in the factory. Um, they would come and work in the factory so they wouldn't have to go uh, to concentration camps. And he had a, an assistant that would work with him. And this assistant was also a Jew. And he would go out into the city square and the people would have to bring their paperwork to the uh, officers that were standing there. And they would look at that paperwork and they would see if they were an essential worker. They would look and see if they were an essential worker. And if they were an essential worker, they would put them in a factory to work. But if they were not, they would send them to the concentration camp. And so this Oscar Schindler, he sent this helper out in the city square. And what he was doing is he was making intercessions for those people. And he would actually rewrite their paperwork. And then later on in the movie, he actually goes, then let me speak for you. And so he would speak for these Jews and he would say, oh no, this guy's a metal worker. He can work in the factory. He's essential. And they would say, okay, and sign his paperwork. And then he would be allowed to take them to the factory and to work. And so it really spoke to me about being essential. And I know a lot of people have been affected by this pandemic that's going on. And I just love that before God, we are all essential. God sent his son to die on a cross for each and every one of us. We are all essential. One of the last things I want to leave you with is this movie at the very end as Oscar um, Schindler at the very end, he had a, a car and at the very end he's going to go into hiding. He's going to go into hiding and he's going to be on the run and he looks at the car that he has and he said, if I would have only sold that car, I could have saved 10 more people. And then he looked at a ring on his finger and he took it off and he said, if I would have sold this ring, I could have saved two more people. There was a pendant on his, a gold pendant on his jacket and he said, if I would have sold this, and he was weeping, and he said, if I would have sold this, I could have saved two more people. You see, I don't want to come to the end and think about the people that I did not reach for the love of Christ. I want to come to the end and know that I tried to reach every person that I could. And I pray, my prayer tonight is that each and every one of us would try to reach somebody for the gospel before our time comes. So I'd like to close in prayer tonight. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for your word tonight who speaks so mightily and so boldly, Lord. I thank you for your love. I thank you for allowing us to come here and share your love um, with all who are online and here tonight lord we ask lord that you would do a mighty work in each and every one of us and we pray these things tonight in jesus name amen